Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Elvin Taylor. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. The next hour is devoted to learning something more, not just about the world of shoes and ships and sealing wax, but about how, what, and why we believe as we do. A time for those willing to question what they think they know or what they may believe, those willing to be uncertain for an hour. I'm Eldon Taylor, and this is Provocative Enlightenment. All right, our chat room is open, and my partner, Ravinder, awaits you there now. You can log on by going to provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. We do have a terrific chat room with some super people. So, Ravinder, you want to tell us all about it now? We do have a great chat room, great people, and everyone in there is very willing to be uncertain. I think that sounds great, and that's the way that you can learn something new. If there's the chance that you could be wrong, you want to pay attention. But it's a good chat room. Um, I get lots of information from them, lots of tips on how to live, and... uh, additional insights. So if you can join us, do come into provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. All right. In today's spotlight, I wish to focus some attention on the idea of science and its paradigms. In Thomas Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, we come to understand that science can be very slow, indeed rigid and resistive to paradigm shifts. Quoting for a moment, Kuhn challenged the then prevailing view of progress in normal science. Normal scientific progress was viewed as development by accumulation of accepted facts and theories. Kuhn argued for an episodic model in which periods of such conceptual continuity in normal science were interrupted by periods of revolutionary science. The discovery of anomalies during revolutions in science leads to new paradigms. New paradigms then ask new questions of old data, move beyond the mere puzzle solving of the previous paradigm, change the rules of the game and the map directing new research. Since Kuhn's History of Science book, many have advanced their pet theories using Kuhn's argument as their fortification for why science resists their ideas. In other words, they might argue something like, science is in the business of protecting itself. So from student to professor, they work to reinforce the existing paradigm and thereby strengthen it against challenges. And where this might have some traction, it is not an absolute protection against nonsense, or at least... It should not be. That said, there are all sorts of loons out there claiming to possess new scientific evidence that the scientific community will not share. They, however, the missionaries of truth, if you will, for a price, usually through the sale of a book or seminar or both, make you privy to their groundbreaking discovery. As a result, we have heard in the past decade or so many full-blown falsehoods held high as science. I have interviewed some of these folks myself, and when you push them into a corner, they often admit that their discovery is only their opinion. There is no hard evidence behind it. Still, there are those who must believe their audiences are imbeciles. For they insist on things like our DNA code literally contains the words God eternal within the body or alternatively God within the body. Now this claim actually persists today among some despite the many scientific refutations to this nonsense. One writer put the entire matter this way, quote, So this is the big secret that he has discovered. Within each cell of our body is God's signature in Hebrew. And because Hebrew is a Semitic language, this supposedly works for Arabic as well. 
From this tiny numerological connection, he bases his entire case and claims a whole new science. It is easy to play around to get just four letters to fit, but to then state that this implies the entire DNA is a library that will shortly be read in Hebrew with the right translation is absurd. Close quote. Now, I could write a book about some of the crazy scams out there sold under the umbrella of new science, just forging its way into a new paradigm. But I think from this one example, you can easily ascertain my point. Where science is constantly challenging itself and where eventually new paradigms do emerge, that should not provide a license to make up stuff and pawn it off as science. Now, the real problem. How are we to sort the revolutionary ideas that are truly pushing the boundaries of science from the garbage mast as poor pseudoscience? The credibility of one sharing information is one way. The number of their qualified peers that have added credibility is good. The level of their education always important. Their published peer-reviewed scientific papers add to the mix the number of studies verifying their work, a real plus. But even then, questions can persist. So it is my inclination to hold in abeyance a final judgment until and unless the paradigm moves. However, that notwithstanding, I am always game to hear a new idea, but I hope I'm not so lame as to believe everything shoved out there as being true. My thoughts anyway, what are yours, Ravinder? I think that's a fascinating spotlight today. I think there's, you know, a great deal to analyze in that and to think about because it does affect all of us. Um, You know, the the book that you're referring to, I am familiar with. I kind of guessed that. And I read the particular book because I have a background in biology. And I wanted wanted to be open-minded to new ideas. And I started reading the book and it was just outright ridiculous. You know, Um, but what I found was when I spoke to other people about it, you know, the kind of answer I got back from them was, oh, I'm not a scientist. I don't understand that stuff. So they take the the word of a so-called expert and the person may not be an expert per se. They just have a platform. So they seem to have lots of people that are agreeing with them and they're saying stuff that people want to believe in. I think the most important thing that we can all take from this is that we have to think for ourselves. And unfortunately, our educational system doesn't teach us how to think. It teaches us how to answer questions and give the correct answers. Um, But learning how to think itself, and um, I mean, that's valuable, invaluable, and that's something that we should all take on ourselves. You know, we have often talked on this show about how willing people are to believe what it is that they want to hear. Yep. And, uh, okay, so um, the fact of the matter is that's the very time that we should be the most guarded. You know, when when I want to hear that, I, that's when I should really question it. Uh, but the idea that, uh, well, I'm not a scientist and therefore I don't really understand this. Uh, the idea that that somehow excuses me from taking responsibility for what it is that I believe, well, that too is a piece of nonsense. We are rational beings. If there is a difference between us and the rest of uh, the animal world, it happens to be in our cognitive abilities. I can't, you know, swing through the trees like a monkey. I can't outrun a cheetah. Uh, But what makes the human condition unique is its ability to think to reason and to negate that well you may as well be swinging in the trees with the monkeys that's my opinion okay every week i read some don't you laugh Even every if week they're I... cute monkeys so, some monkeys are cute so <laughs> every week i read some of your letters as our way of involving you while paying respect to the very important role you play in making this show successful last week our show featured professor gleb Sabursky, and we discussed his work and book the truth seekers handbook Jerry wrote, great guest and timely subject. I would have enjoyed more comment on the political scene, though. 
There are so many lies going back and forth between politicians. It would have been interesting to hear the professor's opinion on some specifics there. Chase wrote, I like this guy, by the way. I am generally reluctant of others who speak on the idea of truth seeking outside of religious context, as I am also a writer on the same subject inside and outside of religious context. But after listening to him speak and seeing his video in the chat room, I get a good feeling from this guy. CB remarked, I did not know there were debiasing strategies. Candor, that is a good word. Very crisp and direct answering guests. I like that unbiasing tool. So did I, CB. Moving on, Lisa wrote, I love my body. Intertalk CD has made me taking better care of my appearance, and it sort of happens spontaneously after using it. Also, I Love My Body is an excellent CD for survivors of sexual abuse, rape, and childhood sexual trauma. Porter wrote, I love Intertalk programs. I've been using them for years and have had incredible results. You guys are the best. And PJ wrote, the Intertalk CD, Freedom from Back Pain, is great. I use the music one at work and the nature at home to sleep by. I do the same thing, uh, PJ. I use the, you know, well, we both do. We use the uh, ocean sounds to sleep by and maybe the music when we're driving in the car. Absolutely. Okay, now to today's show, Purpose and Desire, What Makes Something Alive and Why Modern Darwinism Fails to Explain It, with author Professor Scott Turner. So let me tell you a little about today's guest. Scott Turner is Professor of Biology at the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry in Syracuse, New York. His principal research focus is the emergence of super- Organismal structure and function in the mound in the mound building termites of southern Africa. Now that's a mouthful. This research is motivated by a larger interest in the interface between physiology, evolution, and design. He is the author of two acclaimed books: The Extended Organism, The Physiology of Animal Built Structures, and The Tinker's Accomplice: How Design Emerges from Life Itself. Both published by Harvard University Press. Through the generosity of the Templeton Foundation, he was a visiting scholar at Cambridge University where he began to work on his third book, Purpose and Desire, What Makes Something Alive and Why Modern Darwinism Fails to Explain It, the subject of today's show. So on that, let's get him in here. Welcome to Provocative Enlightenment, Professor Scott Turner. Hello, Eldon. Uh, Great to be here. Thanks for having me on your show. Indeed, my pleasure. And, and I loved your book. You know, I expected it to be much more technically, you, you know, written, uh, loaded with the heuristics of biology and so forth. And where it is technical, it is written for anybody and everybody. I think it's that's a great compliment. They say when you thoroughly understand your subject, you have no difficulty communicating it to anyone anywhere. And your book does indeed do that, sir. So my compliments. Well, Thank you. I'm glad to hear you say that. Uh, I have to say that I sweated blood to make it readable. So <laughs> it's uh, good to know that that sacrifice paid off. I'm glad that you liked it. Oh, I do. And I'm going to ask you about that blood here in a minute. But first, <laughs> Professor, uh, on this show, we like to know who is the messenger, what is the message, and, of course, how do we use it. So to that end, please share with us why you study termites. I found this story somewhat amusing, given that you're a physiologist and you sweat blood. <laughs> well, I kind of stumbled into termites, actually. You know, it's uh, um, uh, people often ask me, you know, how did you get to where you are? And I, I, I have to tell them, if I'm honest, I just kind of stumbled around uh, into these things, and the interest in termites was one of them. I, I, uh, I spent uh, several years, uh, my postgraduate uh, years, in South Africa, and uh, and I ended up in kind of a dusty little place up in the northern part of the country near Botswana. And time in my hands, and uh, and uh, and these termite mounds were all over the place, and. And I uh, first started working on them as a as a student laboratory. You know, there, there's this story about how termites build these mounds to air condition their nests, and there are certain kinds of airflows in there. And you know, that's 
right in my wheelhouse. It's physiology, how how you know material moves about. And uh, so I rigged up a little experiment to demonstrate to the students and uh, how airflow moved in these things. And uh, it didn't behave in any way like the literature, the the widely accepted literature said that it should. And so I thought, gosh, that's an interesting uh, interesting thing. And uh, and I've been occupied with nailing this down ever since. You know, every time I answer a question, uh, new ones come up, and it's kept me busy for nearly 30 years now. Well, that's I'm glad you shared that with us, but I was really looking more for the story about here you are as a physiologist, and you start with alligators, I believe that's what it was, yes. because <laughs> you have a, uh, a squeamishness. You want to flesh that out for us? Well, this is true. You know, I, uh, most physiologists, uh, they're employed in the study of human physiology, you know, for, for good reason. You know, we need to understand how, how bodies work in order to be able to fix them when they go wrong. But uh, I, I, I've had this thing forever. You know, if I even hear of someone's injury, I get this uh, shudder. And, and uh, if I see real blood, uh, it really, it really uh, throws me for a loop. And, of course, that totally disqualifies me for, for uh, any kind of medically related thing. You know, I, I would not have a very good bedside manner. Uh, so to speak, and but I'm still interested in physiology. Still has have always been interested in it, and so I picked things uh, to work on where uh, I not only would not see blood, but where I thought that the uh, that the tables were even. You know, and of course, uh, alligators. I had a collection of 50 alligators for my for my experiments. This is when I was a doctoral student at Colorado State, and uh, I had some that were quite big. Uh, there was there were a couple of six foot uh, alligators. Uh, we named them Wally and Hulk, and and uh, you know my rationale was that uh, well you know they can turn around and eat me if if they get uh, angry enough, and and so I figured that you know the the playing field was level, and uh, from that I went on to work on similar problems, but in a different context on physiology of heat transfer in birds' eggs, and there are some interesting ecological issues related to that. But, uh, you know, I, 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 I was able to do surgery on eggs and never actually had to look a living embryo in the eye, and, and uh, somehow I managed to get through it. And so when I stumbled across termites, it was really a perfect, uh, a perfect subject for me, you know, because no one likes termites. They eat everyone's house. Uh, they die in multitudes, uh, and, you know, a, a few thousand more here or there uh, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't really... Uh, harm anything and these uh, things are incredibly resilient you know you can do all kinds of uh, things to them and they bounce right back and uh, and so they you know in in terms of my natural squeamishness about uh, you know cutting into things and seeing blood and injuries and things like this uh, termites were really the perfect uh, subject for me great story of adaptability a lot of folks would have walked away from <laughs> the study of physiology because of the squeamishness I mean, professor you are you heard today's spotlight. Yes. Since you're one who is challenging the popular view of evolution today, I'm going to ask you straight out, what have I got wrong? Uh, I don't think you have much wrong, to be honest. Uh, you know, the, the um, science is a, it's a unique way of thinking about the world, but uh, there are lots of different ways that one can do science. And, and uh, because... Uh, there are lots of different ways. It's it, it is actually very easy for nonsense to to sneak into the sneak into the discussion, especially when there are political or social questions involved. You know, and and people do want to hear what they want to hear, and and this occurs really across the board. In fact, it, I think it's a real problem in popularization of science, uh, and we see this uh, in lots of venues right now. Uh, but uh, uh, evolutionism and Darwinism is one of those. You know, we 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 have uh, right now uh, the uh, public debate over this uh, divided into really two very polarized camps and 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 one of course is is uh, you know standard evolutionary theory which is taught in high schools and uh, colleges and which is uh, the kind of catechism that we put most biologists through and then of course on the other side there's the main upstart uh, which is intelligent design theory and and of course, uh, the public debate over evolutionism, how it should be taught in the schools, what we should teach our kids about it, these kinds of things 
it's it's marked by an incredible polarization and 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 very few people are talking to one another and a big part of it is is that you have these kinds of these kinds of bubbles you know that, that uh, you know people who all agree with one another talk to one another but they don't talk to anyone outside uh, as well and and so i think it's a real problem and it's it's not just evolutionism it's other uh, areas of of, of public uh, public science uh, if you will but uh, i think you were spot on and and to me, the main question about what science is, you know, or the main message is that really what we're trying to do is we're trying to query nature to tell us answers about what it is and how it works. And and we try as much as we can to not filter the answers that nature gives us through our own um, you know, ideological or intellectual biases, but uh, let's face it, we're all human, and uh, and sometimes that's uh, inevitable. Uh, but of course, the the main message there is that there are many ways to do science. But how we judge good science from bad science is 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 how is it that we are actually asking questions of nature so that we can get as unfiltered an answer as we possibly can. That's perfectly well said. Um, you know, I like to get uh, controversy out of the way first. So, okay, your new book is championed by those who favor intelligent design yes. over the theory of evolution. As you pointed out, we have states where you know it's legal or not legal to teach uh, intelligent design, and a, and a major fight going over that in this country now. Well, because you're kind of you, you've been adopted, I should say. Um, by the intelligent design group, there are those that criticize your work uh, simply on the basis of, you know, who published it, where, you know, where the money came from. Jerry Cohen, for example, is remarked, and I'm sure you're familiar with his blog. The writing of this book is funded through the generosity of the John Templeton Foundation. There's nothing that Templeton likes better than to marinate science and teleology and to show that evolutionary theory is wrong in fundamental ways. Uh, You know, it seems that Coyne and others like him, I just happened to grab his comment because it was short, um, want to discredit your work on the basis of who published it and what their agenda is. What do you have to say to that sort of criticism, Professor? Uh, well, you know, Jerry Coyne's an interesting example of of this kind of this kind of bubble that 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 I'm talking about. You know, if you, if you if you read further in in that particular entry, you know, he he goes on to say that well, he hasn't actually read the book, and 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 so right. you know, of course, of course, this raises the question of of you know how you can make such judgments not only about what I'm saying. But also about me personally and my credentials, without ever having engaged the argument, and 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 you know this is one of the pernicious things about our modern uh, 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 debates over 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 uh, um, science. You know the public role that science plays and how we organize our culture and our society. And uh, turning to the other side, you know the intelligent design uh, idea. This this. This actually started uh, when I published my second book, and and uh, you know you read the complete title. It was uh, it, it, the subtitle was "How Design Emerges from uh, Life Itself," and uh, that book came out uh, uh, just around the time that the Dover, Pennsylvania case was was in full swing, and 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 you know this this uh, had the pernicious effect of making the word design kind of a dirty word, and and there was similar controversy that that. that that swirled around uh, uh, that book, you know, primarily because you know it had the word design right. in the book. But uh, of course, it was an intelligent design theory. You know, the the, the third sentence in that book uh, said, "This is not about intelligent design theory. This is about a real problem of where biological design comes from." And and uh, as an outcome of that controversy, one of the outcomes, uh, uh, Steve Meyer uh, gave me a call and said, well, you know, you're getting beat up uh, by these guys about uh, your supposed affiliation with us. So, you know, why don't you come out and get to know us a little bit? And and so I did. And uh, 
and uh, you know we've we've uh, we've we've had an ongoing um, friendship ever since. You know, I, I think Steve Meyer, for example, is a is a very very bright guy. Uh, I don't agree with him, and uh, I tell him that, and uh, he tells me the same thing. But but uh, uh, you, you know we 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 have developed actually a good professional uh, relationship and a good intellectual relationship as well, and. One of the things that struck me, well, there are two things that struck me, actually. One is that the critique that intelligent design theory is actually making of modern evolutionary biology is actually pretty sound. And it's a critique that actually is becoming more uh, widely held amongst my uh, professional colleagues, even if, uh, if we, you know, we, we don't always go to the same uh, conclusion that someone like Steve Meyer does, for example. And so, uh, you know, that was kind of a... a, a, a uh, a striking thing to me. And the other thing <clears throat> that struck me was that I got invited to a couple of intelligent design conferences when and they were they're open to the public and it attracted a number of of interesting people, uh, you know, lots of engineers, lots of computer scientists, lots of high school teachers and one of the things that struck me about getting to know those people is that, you know, these people are engaged, they're intelligent, they're curious about evolution, what it means, uh, trying to decide what's right and what's wrong. You know, they struck me as real seekers, and, and I didn't think that they were being particularly well served by either the the one side, the, the Jerry Coins of the world, or or the other side, the people who had been uh, committed to intelligent design theory. And the reason they were at this intelligent design conference was because in their perception, uh, this was an open-minded group uh, uh, gathering together against what was really a kind of closed-minded uh, dogmatic uh, community of, of evolutionists. Now, now I have to say that that's an unfair characterization of, of the evolutionary uh, biology community, but nevertheless, it's very much the public face that the evolutionary biology community uh, presents. And and uh, that was one of the reasons why I wanted to write this book, because, um, you know, I think there are criticisms to be made of, of modern evolutionary theory. I think that they're not always uh, tolerated or welcomed in the public uh, arena. And, uh, you know, Jerry Coyne, I think, is probably one of the uh, prime examples of that. Uh, of course, I could name others, uh, uh, you know, if we, if we want to go there. And my hope in writing this book is uh, actually a, 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 a written to the general public uh, is that you know let's get some conversations going here you know let's let's look at what's right and what's wrong on both sides and 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 let's see if we can actually you know have a richer uh, debate in the public uh, uh, sphere over uh, evolution because it's a very important debate that we have. I agree totally, and and your answer contained my next question because oh, good. <laughs> Coyne uh, essentially wrote his criticisms without ever reading your book, which I find to be evidence a priori of that closed-minded, um, demigodal kind of approach so many take to uh, honest inquiry. We yes, have a break yeah. coming up, Professor. When we come back, I'm, I'm going to ask you uh, about something I read many, many years ago. Uh, and uh, Well, I'll, I'll hold that question. We're speaking with Professor Scott Turner about his work and book, Purpose and Desire. You can learn more about our guest by visiting his website. And be ready for this. ESF.edu. That's ESF.edu forward slash EFB forward slash Turner. Now, if you have a video, now we have a video for you in our chat room featuring the biology of sex drive. Why not? So if you're not in the chat room already, now is the time to get on over there, and you can do that by going to provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. Please stay tuned. We'll be right back. You're listening to Provocative Enlightenment with Elton Taylor. Change has never been easier. Whether you wish to lose weight, stop smoking, build better relationships, become creative, enjoy ultra prosperity, or simply relax and promote self-healing, InnerTalk has been repeatedly demonstrated effective in the most rigorous of scientific studies. Our customers love InnerTalk. Sean wrote, I have struggled with bulimia for over 30 years and have never been able to lose weight without restoring to it. 
until I used Inner Talk. Vicky wrote, My hubby has been using the Stop Snoring CD, and already his dangerous and raucous snoring levels have stopped. Celeste wrote, I recently graduated from Taft Law School with honors. I'm writing to tell you how much your Inner Talk CD, Excel in Exams, has helped me. With over 300 titles to choose from, there is something for everyone. Check it out today by going to innertalk.com. Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Alvin Taylor. Welcome back. If you just join us, we're chatting with Professor Scott Turner about his work and book, Purpose and Desire, What Makes Something Alive and Why Modern Darwinism Has Failed to Explain It. All right. I gave you a website before the break. It's kind of a complicated one. Let me give you a better one that you can reach uh, our guest at today. Try jscottturner.com. That's pretty easy. jscottturner.com. Okay, as you know, every week we ask our guests for their favorite music, music that has some true significance to them. Music psychology is a field of research with practical relevance in many areas, including intelligence, creativity, personality, and social behavior. It's also something I'm writing about now and a new hobby of mine. So, we just played some of 18 Aprils by Michael Franks. Tell us, Professor... Why is this music important to you, and how does it inform us about who you are? Well, uh, I'm a big fan of Michael Franks. I I, I love his uh, his uh, approach to music. You know, he's quite a he's quite a serious scholar of uh, South American uh, music, uh, particularly samba and Antonio Carlos Jobim, and uh, and that uh, song was from uh, his his album dedicated to Antonio uh, Carlos Jobim and and that's one aspect of it but uh, the other aspect of it is that my wife and I uh, came across uh, that music uh, um, shortly around our 18th wedding anniversary and uh, it just seemed to sum up for us uh, so much uh, of our relationship and and uh, and so it's a very meaningful song for me for that reason wonderful answer all right sir i promised you that before the break i had a question based on something i came across years ago in a book neural theology um I, I read that it takes DNA to create DNA and that the material necessary uh, at the time supposedly life originated on this planet to create DNA just simply didn't exist. Uh, I subsequently did the best I could to search out to determine whether or not this was an accurate statement. And to date, I have to say, it appears to be accurate. Professor, is that the fact or not? Uh, that it takes DNA to make DNA? Uh, and that the yes. building blocks to, to create DNA did not exist at the time life supposedly crawled out on, on this earth. Well, this is this is this is the real dilemma, you know, one, this is the $64 million question, if you will, you know. Uh, there have been lots of uh, calculations of the statistical probability and likelihood of of, of DNA uh, or something like that emerging spontaneously, and they're almost infinitesimally small. You know, and 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 this is one of the things that, or one of the statistics that uh, the intelligent design uh, side uh, uh, touts quite frequently. Uh, but it's 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 actually advanced uh, by uh, lots of other scientists as uh, as well, and and this is the real problem, and one of the problems that I was trying to address. You know, if you if you look at the history of of, of Darwinism, it it it, it actually uh, evolved uh, quite uh, significantly from uh, the way Charles Darwin himself thought about uh, evolution. And in the early 20th century, it became really a theory of heredity of of, of 
of what hereditary memory uh, was. And of course, the, the drive to discover the structure of DNA was very much uh, drawn from that, from that tradition. But uh, Charles Darwin himself had a much more uh, nuanced uh, picture of it. But because the material nature of the gene has dominated our thinking so, so uh, uh, heavily in the in in the 20th century, the 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 gene itself has has become almost uh, an idol, a, a kind of a kind of a kind of a cult figure, and and uh, a lot of uh, uh, ink is spilled over trying to. Um, explain DNA, where it comes from, uh, uh, what it is, and these kinds of things, and 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 it's 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 led everyone, I think, into a little bit of a dead end, and and you know the fact is that it it does it, it takes more than DNA to make DNA. It takes a whole host of other molecules. It takes lots of proteins. It takes it takes uh, RNA. It takes uh, an entire physiological system that mobilizes the matter and energy to enable this uh, a cell to pull off this trick and, and and so if you approach life as a physiologist as i do uh, you know you 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 cannot be focused on one thing like that and and uh, and come away with any kind of a credible uh, way of thinking about it uh, that's not to say that you can't learn an awful lot by doing that and we clearly have you know there's no there's no doubt about that but uh, you're not going to come away with a coherent theory of what life is and 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 what makes it work and in fact how it evolves without taking that that broad um, uh, that broad wide scoped uh, vision of of what life is and and you know this is one of the main points uh, th that I've that I've made in the book you know you you simply uh, cannot uh, uh, get to a coherent theory of life if you're focused strictly on mechanism on materialism uh, there has to be some kind of motivator behind this in, in order to overcome these really daunting uh, statistical improbabilities that anything like life should even exist and never mind uh, that it uh, actually works you know so so you know I'm just saying that uh, you, you know the way out of the the very polarized dilemma that we're facing right now is 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 we need to step back and and chart a third way between these two uh, very um, uh, diametrically opposed ways of thinking about life and evolution well, going directly to your book, Professor, is that why you think biology is in crisis? Uh, yes, I do. And, and of course, the principal reason, if I had to say it in a nutshell, is that we biologists uh, don't really have a very good idea of what life is. And, and if we can't define our subject, how can we study it coherently? And, and, and you know, one of the one of the uh, consequences of not really understanding what life is is that we we tolerate all kinds of incoherencies creeping into our thinking about what life is and uh, these incoherencies are often unquestioned uh, they're often the subject of well not questioning them is actually the subject of uh, what you mentioned at the beginning of, of the hour namely you have uh, systems that enforce uh, orthodoxy and particular ways of thinking uh, about about life and and these things just kind of sit unchallenged for decades and and uh, and you really have to delve deeply into into you know where this thinking comes from in order to start see seeing these incoherencies Sometimes I think the more entrenched we become in a system, the more resistive we are to maybe even work that is that, that's pioneering work that's forgotten or it, it's discounted. Uh, the work of Lamar comes into my mind, but the work yes. of Claude Bernard, uh, who I, I believe was the uh, founder of experimental physiology. And you discuss, you know, his ideas of homeostasis. Flesh that all out for us, will you? And, 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 and how it bears on this discussion. Well, this is one of these uh, areas where 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 um, a certain amount of incoherency and and denial has crept into our thinking. Uh, uh, Claude Bernard, who uh, you mentioned, he was a contemporary of Charles Darwin, and uh, and and he is revered as the founder of our modern science of physiology. That's how I uh, came to know him, and and it. If you look in a modern physiology textbook, you'll see that uh, if you look under homeostasis, you'll see uh, basically how the thermostat works. You know, what are the parts here and there? How do they connect to one another? And those kinds of those kinds of things. But if you delve back into what Bernard himself actually 
said. You know, he was a superb experimental physiologist. He he deserves uh, uh, completely the the the, uh, the the title of being the founder of modern physiology. But whereas modern physiology looks at homeostasis as the outcome of the operation of a machine, uh, namely the you know the thermostat or or whatever in the body that regulates temperature or others that regulate uh, other properties of the body, uh, Bernard actually had an entirely different way of thinking about that. You know, he he regarded uh, life as a fundamentally unique phenomenon in the universe. He 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 was very skeptical of the ability of uh, of physics or chemistry to be able to inform us what life is. Uh, he had a great deal of respect for that. He, he uh, you know, he, he uh, uh, thought that chemistry and bio and uh, physics could tell us a lot, but he was very clear that, that uh, the homeo, the, 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 these, these mechanisms, these physical and chemical mechanisms actually emerged from this fundamental property of life, which he uh, deemed homeostasis. And, 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 you know, the, the um, ironic thing about the way uh, modern science has evolved is that is that we have totally flipped Bernard's ideas on its head, you know, and 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 we we have cherry picked the parts of his thought that we like, but uh, have sort of uh, buried the the the, the uh, thought, thoughts that we don't like, and and among them is this uh, is this notion that uh, homeostasis is not the outcome of a mechanism. The mechanism is actually the outcome of the homeostasis, and and when you uh, turn around and look at the problem from the same way that Bernard did, then all kinds of other um, uh, uh, um, uh, revisions seem to seem to uh, uh, reveal themselves. And and so, for example, one of the things that has happened in evolutionary biology, I mentioned that it's become an entirely a theory of heredity, uh, is that um, uh, we're assuming that all the wonderful adaptations come out of the the uh, uh, heredity of particular stretches of DNA, but actually the DNA is coming out from well-functioning organisms. And for years this was uh, this was heresy. But uh, you know, as we learn more and more about what genes are, how they work, um, uh, how they're influenced by the environment, we're starting to see that oh gosh, you know, maybe it's not the genes that are driving the evolutionary process. Maybe the genes are just sort of along for the ride and and maybe it's actually and this is the claim i make in the book is that homeostasis properly understood is actually the driving force behind behind uh, the evolution of life on earth that uh, the genes which have always been thought of as the kind of leading indicator of, of the evolutionary process actually may be the lagging indicators uh, you know being dragged along in the wake of of this this fundamentally uh, physiological and fundamentally homeostatic phenomenon of life itself Okay, but now that, you know, Jean-Baptiste uh, Lamarck essentially was discredited mm. by uh, Darwin. Um, and that is a very, you know, uh, Lamarckian kind of a perspective, is it not? I mean, the heredity, uh, if I recall correctly, uh, Lamarckism is the hypothesis that an organism can pass on characteristics that are acquired from parent to child. Is it, I mean... Is that what you're saying? Is that what drives uh, what we call evolution as opposed to DNA? And, and if so, why is it, you know, not held more popularly? Well, this is a prime example of the kind of revisionism and and uh, and uh, uh, th th those kinds of trends that have happened in trying to make biology and evolution a purely mechanistic phenomenon. Now, while uh, Darwin certainly was skeptical of of, of Lamarck and his thought. Uh, 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 nevertheless, he, he adopted a model of heredity that was pure Lamarckism, and 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 so Darwin was more of a Lamarckian than than most people are prepared to uh, admit, and. This uh, notion that Lamarckism is just the inheritance of acquired characters, this is one of these uh, things like what was done to Claude Bernard's thought that, uh, that that came out in the in the push to make biology a purely mechanistic phenomenon. But if you delve actually back into the thought of what Lamarck uh, was actually saying, 
inheritance of acquired character is, you know, it was a part of it, but th- that, that it wasn't the main part. What, what he was principally saying is that, is that there's something that uh, drives uh, evolution and change and adaptation in organisms. This was conventional wisdom amongst the, amongst the medical uh, establishment at, at his time. What Lamarck said was that, well, you know, this act can actually extend, these forces can actually extend across generations as well. So so what he was uh, proposing was really kind of a unified uh, uh, theory of adaptation and evolution. And those two things were actually uh, uh, cut asunder from one another uh, in about the at the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century, uh, mostly at the behest of a German um, evolutionist, uh, August Weissmann, a very fine biologist. But because he was uh, tied into making evolution a purely uh, hereditary phenomenon, uh, he basically drove a wedge between uh, how life works and how life evolves, and and uh, and so uh, and, and and so that that basically split apart this kind of unified thinking of Lamarck himself. And uh, as I said, you know, as we come to know more about what genes are, how they work, how they interact with the with the cell and with the organism, and how organisms are assembled, it's looking more and more like Lamarck was on the right right track and you know, that you know the, that 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 you cannot divorce how life works in organisms from how life evolves that is changes across generations and and so Lamarck is undergoing a little bit of a renaissance but he was discredited you know for many many years uh, uh, basically by um, I, I think a philosophically uh, wrong-headed way to think about life and evolution interesting uh, professor <clears throat> Intentionality, purpose, that's something that I think most people are going to misunderstand. Uh, what do you mean by purpose and intention with regard to evolution? Are you really saying that, um, as you say in your book, as you suggest in your book, that uh, birds fly because they decided they wanted to fly? Uh, yes, that's what I'm saying. And, and, and it's, it's not just something that I'm throwing out there, you know, the, 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 um, part of the confusion and, and it's rife is that, is that there are a lot of, uh, uh, different ways to think about uh, cognition, uh, intentionality, purpose, uh, uh, intelligence, and uh, those sorts of things. So, one of the things that I tried to do in the book was to was to drill down and to try to understand what what we really mean by those terms and you know, because they're thrown around in some in some rather careless ways and in doing so that leads to all kinds of uh, uh, confusion naturally and incoherency and and so what i'm saying is that uh, all of these phenomena are actually a part of the or an outcome of the striving of living systems to sustain themselves and this is the radical uh, root of claude bernard's uh, idea of homeostasis and and if you uh, 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 delve into these things, the conclusion that I've come to is that you cannot have homeostasis without cognition, that is, without some way of mapping uh, what's going on in the outside world onto your internal uh, workings. And you also have to have that coupled to uh, some means for living things to manipulate the outside world to channel matter and energy uh, to the organism at the rates it needs to be able to persist. And and because they live in a variable environment, you have to be able to uh, track what's happening in the in the outside environment. And and so what I'm saying is that is that, you know, li- life is purposeful. It, it's purposeful in the sense that that it it strives. And I use that word deliberately. It strives to survive and to persist. And and in order to do that, you have to uh, be able to do things that, uh, in other contexts, in ourselves, for example, uh, are really uh, intentional uh, processes. And so, you know, not only are we intentional, but we're intentional in a different way from, uh, say, my dog, for example. And uh, and and if you uh, delve into what the mechanisms of that are, what's going on that underlies our own intentionality and cognition, you see parallels operating even down to the level of bacteria and and, uh, microbial communities.
things. And and so what I'm arguing is that is that is it really life? Uh, you cannot divorce it from cognition. You cannot divorce it from intentionality. And uh, when you're trying to understand not only how life works but also how it evolves, uh, you can't divorce those questions from the uh, phenomenons from these phenomena of intentionality and purpose and desire. Well. Yeah, I'm going to say this. The book is Purpose and Desire, What Makes Something Alive and Why Modern Darwinism Has Failed to Explain It. We often ask provocative questions. We have provocative guests. I found your material to be overwhelming. Uh, argument <laughs> for exactly uh, that position. And it definitely doesn't, I don't believe, take sides with either, but finds a middle ground between... Um, Design arguments and evolution. Professor, I want to thank you for, you know, your time and your work and your wonderful book. Uh, and I'm going to invite everybody again to visit uh, the professor's website at jscottturner.com. Thank you, sir, for joining us today and for your willingness to share. Well, we've come to the end of another episode of Provocative Enlightenment. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed our show and will join us again next week, same time and same place. And do tell your friends, have them join us as well. And do go get the book, Purpose and Desire. All right, until next time, wherever you are in the world, remember, believing in yourself always matters. Provocative Enlightenment has been brought to you by Progressive Awareness Research and other sponsors. Provocative Enlightenment is a syndicated show and appears on other networks. For a schedule of showtimes, visit ProvocativeEnlightenment.com. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor, write to Eldon at EldonTaylor.com.